Hello, and welcome to my lecture on the Tsugi Frameworks data model. Uh, this is part of my YouTube for various uh, Tsugi developer information. I encourage you to look at some of the other videos on this YouTube channel. Um, you can get a hold of the data model for Tsugi and play with it. I've got it checked into GitHub. Uh, I, I'm using MySQL Workbench. That is a free tool from Oracle uh, MySQL that does visualization and design and lets you look at models. So the basic idea of uh, Sugi runtime is that ultimately there are three real primary objects in Sugi that you know represent the current user, the current course, and the current resource link from the learning management system. And uh, within that, it's a multi-tenant architecture. And so we have four basic concepts of tenant, course, user, link. And so if you look at a typical learning management system, here I have, um, you know, Moodle. And uh, so, the, so Tsugi is designed to be launched from learning management systems. And so this might be one particular instance of Moodle. There are lots of instances of Moodle that might have different URLs. And then the course ID, Python for Informatics, happens to be this one course. And ID equals 5, that happens to be in Moodle, the primary key of the... Uh, course context in LTI we call that context because it might be a course or it might be a group or it might be something a site work site or a club or something like that so we don't want to call it course um, and then there is the current logged in user whoever that happens to be and that that there's some roles in that as well so we have a role in addition to current logged in user and then throughout the course we have many resource links so there's many uh, resource links and so our data model has to capture you know, multiple tenants, multiple courses, multiple resource links, and then multiple users with multiple roles. And so that's sort of the real world that we're trying to represent in the Tsugi tool hosting framework because Tsugi wants to be sort of lots of these little tools for all kinds of learning management systems. And if we take a look at the Sakai, we see a similarly a tenant. You know, there's many instances of Sakai running around the world. We see a course, a.k.a. context. We even see in the Sakai URL a big long string of hexadecimal characters and dashes. That is the primary key for, or at least the logic key, for the uh, context within Sakai. And the uh, user, this happens to not show you, and, but it's like I'm logged in as a person. And similar, they're, similarly, there are lots of links in, say, this lesson builder, um, you know, one for the assignment one auto grader, the assignment two auto grader. And so Tsugi wants to be able to, to function in all of these environments equivalently. And so this is the basic uh, Tsugi data model. Um, and you can pull this out of that uh, GitHub URL and you can play with it with the uh, MySQL workbench. Um, and so if we look at this, uh, this is not the entire Tsugi data model, but it is sort of the big part of the Tsugi data model. Uh, the LTI key, this is the tenant, uh, LTI user, LTI context, um, LTI membership is for roles, and then LTI link for each resource link, and then the result, because there are results that are connected to links. Now, in the future versions of LTI, there will be a much more sophisticated result service, so this is enough data modeling for the LTI 1.x and the LTI 2.0 result service where a result is associated with a link basically. And so you can see things like, you know, we can see that users are connected to contexts through memberships. We can see things like uh, links are, are within contexts. Uh, links are sort of one, are, are, a, are a, a connector between users, so each user has a result for each link, so each user can have a grade, and there's things like grades in there, etc., etc. Um, in LTI 1, we have services, and we keep those in a separate table. That's just sort of so we don't put too much stuff, whereas in LTI 2, we have the um, result URL for LTI 2. So if you go through this, you can see a lot of how we support both LTI 1 and LTI 2 all at the same time. Um, we see things like the settings URL for LTI 2, um, but we also see something like um, settings, for example, in a context, so that uh, an L a Tsugi tool is capable of storing and retrieving settings, even if the learning management system doesn't support the LTI 2 settings. 
Um, and so this is all set up to allow a nice set of APIs to wrap either LTI 1 or LTI 2 and then expand as we get more and more LTI services uh, going forward. So if we look at some of the conventions for naming, it's, uh, it's very Rails-like. And so it's highly inspired by Rails. Uh, all tables, except perhaps link table, except perhaps many-to-many -many tables, have auto-increment integer primary keys, just like Rails would expect. We have a series of at fields that are dates, and they are, I use the exact same uh, names for those, like created at and updated at, just like Rails would. And for foreign keys, like uh, key ID, I use the exact Rails convention where I have the, um, you know, the name of the table and the name of the, the name of the f table underscore ID. Now, I don't follow Rails 100%. Um, the two places that I diverge, I've just been doing this long enough that I find that naming all the primary keys ID is annoying when you're going to do your own joins because you end up with, uh, if you're joining across a bunch of tables, as you'll see later in this talk, um, it's just annoying after a while to say ID as table underscore ID. It's just like name it table underscore ID. And then there is a perfect match between both ends of the, of the foreign key relationship where, you know, key ID and key ID. For me, it just seems more elegant, so I don't go Rails. <clears throat> and the column names and table names are both singular, so I don't come up with a tricky pluralization or anything like that. I just sort of name them like I would name them, mostly a, a singular. Uh, another thing that you'll see that, uh, that might send you for a little bit of a loop is this notion of a SHA-256 keys. Um, and so, for example, if you are talking about an LTI user, there, what we're handed is the primary key in the learning management system for each user. And while we might, in, in Moodle, for example, those are integers that start at zero, you know, I start at one, one, two, three, four, five, so they're pretty short. Um, in something like Sakai, they're uh, 40 character GUIDs. Um, but the problem is, is the specification doesn't put a precise limitation on them. So you probably should assume they're at least 4K and because the LTI doesn't say these have to be less than 128 characters, it is dangerous to model the data coming in from your learning management system as anything other than a text or a large varchar field, maybe 65,000 varchar or something. And so because of the way MySQL does indexes, and of course you can override this, but in default, most MySQL configurations, there's a maximum length that can be indexed. And so what I do is, I basically say, okay, I'm going to take this thing, no matter how long it is, and I'm going to SHA-256 it, and then that brings it down to 64 characters. And that's what I make unique, right? I do not, I do not turn this into a key. I do not index the user key, but I do index and turn into the key SHA-256. So anywhere in the WHERE clause that I want to look up, if I'm handed an external user key, I have to SHA-256 it before I can really use it in a WHERE clause. Now I can select the original full key as just a text field. And so it's a, it's a choice that I've made. Um, an alternative that was suggested is if they're greater than 64 characters, SHA-256 them. But I just kind of figured I'll SHA-256 all of them. Part of this is, you know, if this is something you can find a way to improve, I want, to, I want your suggestions as to how to improve it. Um, we also expect inside the Tsugi data model that we're going to have um, all foreign keys explicitly modeled in create table statements with constraints. Um, and part of this is, is we expect this to be a multi-tenant container, multi-course container, tenants may come and go, and we want to make it relatively easy to clean up tenants. You can even, with a little bit of work, use these foreign key fully modeled foreign key relationships to kind of extract a whole tree of information. So we want to be able to do a transitive closure of a tenant. So we insist that all tables ultimately are connected uh, up to a tenant. And the only time we do uh, something that's a little different than that, there's some, a few very special situations. But in general, we want to be able to do the transitive closure right from a key all the way down through the data model. We want to be able to get to all the items. And we want to be able to delete a tenant and all associated data 
with a single command. And the same would be true for a course or a user. If I'm going to delete the user, I want to get all that user's data everywhere in the system, not just you know this user and I got to go hunt that user down. So we have all we have some modeling rules that basically have the constraints and foreign keys and on delete convention. And so you can kind of see that everything everything sort of works its way up to key. Users are associated with a key. Contexts are associated with a key. Services are associated with a key. You know, and then things work their way up. And you can always find a way back to key. So if this is a resource link, you know, and we whack, we get rid of the key, it's going to get rid of all the corresponding resource links because it's going to get rid of all the corresponding courses and it's going to get rid of all the corresponding resource links. So it allows us to do a lot of nice cleanup. Now, tools, as they build new tables, um, they, will, they will need to have a constraint that links to one of these four tables. A link table, the context table, the user table, or the key table. So it's, it's, it's okay to have rows that don't link to all of these, but they've got to link to one of these, okay? So that we can find transitive closure, not just in the core tables that I just described, but also in the tables that tools create. So for example, if the uh, very, very simple attendance tool, um, it has a date, it has an IP address, and, a t and an updated at, and it's really a link table between resource link ID and user ID, right? So, so these, are, these are core tables here. Oops, go back, go back. These are core tables here, right? Those are the core tables. And so if you're building a tool that does attendance, then you have a rule of you have to fully model a link back. Now this one does two links back, but you can see how if we were to delete a link or a user, it would delete all the user data or all the link data or both, and it would clean up this attendance table as we cleaned up the user table and link table. And so that's kind of the rule of if you're starting to build tables for your tools, you've got to link them to one of those three tables. This is an example of linking to two, I mean, one of the four tables. This is an example of linking to two of the four tables, which is exactly perfectly fine. And so these are kind of, you know, upward, upward constraints that are saying, you know, user ID references the user ID field in the LTI user table. That kind of constraint is what you need to have. Okay. okay. So this is what it looks like in a typical database.php file. And I'll talk a bit more about these database.php file. These are the migrations. And one of the biggest things that it does is, a, is the create table. Uh, one of the conventions we have is that we have prefixes on all tables. And that's for those who have hosting environments that only give you one database. And you want to have multiple applications or multiple instances of the same application. So you might have a you know, P underscore attend for production and D underscore attend. And there's a configuration option called db prefix, which allows us to add this a prefix to all the tables everywhere. Now, normally, if you're just kind of running it as a developer, you make this be empty, and so the table is just named attend. So it's usually you just leave it blank if you can have multiple databases. It's a it's a rare case these days that you get a hosting provider that only lets you have one database, and you really want to have multiple applications. But it's common enough that we want to be able to handle that. So this is an example of one of those constraints. We do want to name all the constraints so that you know we can alter them later if we want to do a migration. Um, and so we basically are saying, OK, this, this link ID key uh, links references the link ID in the LTI link table. Away you go. Putting the prefixes and, of course, on delete cascade, on update cascade. And then this also models that connection to the user ID table um, so that that's modeled properly. Here is a more complex data model for the peer grading. And it has like, um, it has the assignment, which is sort of like the configuration of the assignment and that's hooked up to a link. Then a submission, which is a connection between a user and the assignment. So that's each user's submission to the peer grader. And then you have a, a, a per user, so, so there's a, so there's one submission, and then there's like you know three other people that have to grade it, or four other people that have to grade it. That's what this is. This user ID is um, the user ID of the person who did the grading. Um, 
hmm, maybe that should actually have a foreign key up to here. That's a good question. None of this is perfect. It's always a, it's always a work in progress. Um, then we have the flagging. And so what you see, though, is you see that if I got rid of this and I got rid of that, then it would percolate down into all these tables and, and clean those tables up for a particular user and or a particular link. <clears throat> uh, just as an example, the blob table, uh, I've chosen to, as I wrote this code, I just chose to make blobs belong to the context rather than to the link. And so that's just a choice. I don't have to hook it to the link. I'm making blobs that, that associate with the context. So if you upload some blobs and then you kill the link, it doesn't kill the blobs. It kills, the, but if you do get rid of the course, it does kill the blobs. So you see how these things eventually have to connect to link, user, or context, or the key. The key is way out here. Um, that would be rather global because that would be some kind of a data structure that your tool would be building that would be sort of tenant wide. That doesn't mean it's uh, that you can't do that. It just may or may not be something that it's just not going to be really common to hook up a, one of your tool tables to a tenant. 